Well, amen. If you have your Bibles, you're going to be turning to Genesis chapter 33. Genesis chapter 33. We're back on our study in the life of Jacob, the beginning of Israel, seeing a rascal changed into a righteous man. Last time we were together, we had seen the experience that he had had with the angel, wrestling with the angel of God. And through that experience, his life being transformed, he received a blessing of the Lord as he held on to that angel and said, I'm not letting you go till I till you bless me. And his name was changed at that time from Jacob to Israel. After that experience, he was to encounter his brother Esau, and he does encounter him. And he finds out that his brother has forgiven him and they have a good relationship. His brother said, let me help you and, and let's go together as we travel back to the homeland. And, and that's when he made the statement, no, I must travel at the pace of the children. And that's where we ended the story. Beginning here in Genesis chapter 33, I want to begin with verse 18, just to read the last uh, three verses of that chapter. Then I'm going to move over to chapter 35 and read a few verses. And then in the midst of this message, I will tell you what transpires in chapter 34. This is Genesis 33, verse 18 and following. Now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan which he came from Padaram and encamped before the city. And he bought the piece of land where he had pitched his tent from the hand of the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohi Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. Look at verse, uh, chapter 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and live there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments." And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the days of, day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. Now when you read this story and you see those two readings I just had, one at the end of chapter 33 and one in chapter 35, it seems as though it's just kind of a casual event that happens in his life. But today I want you to really focus because I'm going to show you a significant event and a significant change between those two chapters. Because it's very important that we understand the difference between what happened in chapter 33 and what's going to happen in chapter 35. And you're going to understand that because of what happens in chapter 34. I know I might be confusing, but I promise you, you stay with me. I'll help you to understand that. One of the things I want to point out to begin with in chapter 35 that's very important. In verse number one, it says, then God said to Jacob. Now, if you remember your English class, the next thing that you have there is going to be called a quotation mark. Okay. That quotation mark is very, very important. It's important in the Bible anytime there's a quotation mark, especially when it is preceded or followed by God said. That's important. The difference between what happens in chapter 33 and 35 is if you'll notice in chapter 33, there are no quotation marks. But in chapter 35, verse 1, there's a quotation mark that says, and God told him to do this. God said to him to do this. And it's important in our lives, just as in the Bible, that we live in the realm of quotation marks from God. Do you understand what I mean by that? We're supposed to be living in the realm where God is speaking to us. God is sharing with us. God is revealing to us what He desires, what He wants, what His will is, His direction is for our lives. We cannot be satisfied just to walk through life without the quotation marks or without the direct communication from God. Beginning in chapter 33 where I read, Jacob, it says, made his way to Shechem. That doesn't seem like a big deal. Shechem is one of the places inside the Canaan land. 
It was one of those places where he had traveled from his uncle's house. He'd made his way on this journey. And now he comes into the Canaan land and he chooses to live in Shechem. He actually purchased the land for 100 pieces of silver from Hamar, Shechem's uh, father. He buys that place and he settles in in that place. It says he even goes and he builds an altar there. The altar that says that God is the God of Israel. All of that sounds okay except for one problem. The problem is there's no quotation mark. In other words, God did not necessarily tell him to go to Shechem. So why would he choose to go to Shechem? Because it looks like Jacob is trying to follow the example of a good example but he's trying to follow the spiritual journey of somebody who preceded him, his grandfather. His name was Abraham. When Abraham came into the Canaan land, the place that he stopped is Shechem. Hold your hand here. Turn back to Genesis chapter 12. Let me show you. Genesis chapter 12. Whenever Abram, he was named Abram at that time, journeys out from Ur of Chaldees or Haran, and makes his way towards the Canaan land. This is what it says in verse 6. And Abram passed through the land, talking about the Canaan land, as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. Here's what it says. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. He was at Shechem because that's where God told him to go. He journeyed to Shechem and that's the place where he built his altar. So whenever Jacob is making his way back in from being with his uncle Laban and he's coming back into the Canaan land, God doesn't tell him directly to go to Shechem, but somehow in Jacob's mind, it's as though he's living out that spiritual experience of Abraham and he decides that's where my grandfather stopped because everybody knows, knew his journey. They knew what Abraham had done and where he was and everything that was important and every place he built an altar. And he says, that's where my grandfather went. That's where my grandfather started. That's where he built his first altar. That's where I am going to go. So he picks up all of his family, he moves to Shechem, and he camps there. But remember, there are no quotation marks. God didn't tell him to go to Shechem, but he chose to go there. Now, let me tell you the danger. There's a danger whenever you're trying to live out somebody else's spiritual experience. When you're trying to live on somebody else's spiritual journey no matter who that might be, a relative of yours, somebody who was your spiritual mentor, whatever... You cannot live out their spiritual journey. You cannot walk in their step. If you're trying to live out your life, your spiritual journey with their spiritual journey, it just does not work. Rather than that, God doesn't want Jacob to live out his spiritual journey following in his grandfather's path. But rather, you're going to find in chapter 35, God wants him to walk his spiritual journey. The journey that he started with and where he was and he has a plan for Jacob's life that is unique and different from anything Abraham would ever do. You and I must be careful about the same thing. That we just don't follow into the path and we're going to follow somebody else's example, going to walk the same way they did in their journey and that everything is just going to be fine because it doesn't turn out fine. Chapter 34 is a chapter of tragedy. It's a chapter of tragedy. It begins in verse 1, and it says that his daughter, Dinah, the only daughter that I actually ever mentions whenever all the sons were born, that Dinah, she became friends, or she befriended the daughters of the land, the daughters of the Canaanites. Now, that's not a good thing, because the fact of being in fellowship with them and in that land, there was not going to be the separation and what the goal would have been is to take the Canaanites and to join them with the Israelites and all of them would have become one people. But that's not the way God had it. God wanted it to be distinctly the fact that the Israelites were their own. And so Dinah goes in and she begins to befriend the daughters of the land. And what happens next is the prince of the land, his name is Shechem, he looks at her, he desires her, he takes her and he rapes her. That's exactly what happens. He takes and he forcefully has relations with her. Now, whenever that happens and Jacob finds out about it, he doesn't say anything at first until his sons will come home. 
Whenever Shechem knew her, he loved her. He thought he loved her. And he said, Dad, I want you to go and I want you to do whatever it takes to get her to be my wife. Well, if he had got that in right order, even though it wasn't going to work, it would have been a whole lot better, wouldn't it? If he had desired her, tried to have her as his wife before he raped her, but he didn't. He used her, he defiled her, and then he tells his dad, Dad, I want you to go out there and I want you to make arrangements for uh, me to be able to get her to be my wife. And so the dad, Hamar, comes out and talks to Jacob and talks to the sons. And whenever he's talking to those sons and, and to Jacob, he says, basically, what, is, what would it be that, that we could have your daughter and my son to be married and have this relationship together and we could become one people and our lands could become together and you could be free to walk here? What would it take? What would the dowry be or what would I have to do? Well, that's when the two oldest sons of of uh, Jacob, who were the full brothers to Dinah, says, well, I tell you what would have to happen. What you're going to have to do in order to marry our sister, you would have to be circumcised just like we have been circumcised. Because there's no way that we would ever have relations, that we would have relations and be in communion with you unless you are perceived as clean. Well, whenever they heard that, Hamor and Shechem, they, Shechem so, so much wanted to have this relationship, he, they went and talked to all of the men and all the people of the land and said, this is what they're requiring of us, that we would have, be circumcised and be known as clean and then we'll get married and, and, and then they'll become our people. And, and going and read through the story, it says, and their cattle and their herds will become ours. In other words, all of that stuff will be ours. So we need to do this. Well, they talked those, all of those men of that city into being circumcised. And what happened then on the third day whenever the pain was severe. Have you ever heard this whenever you've gone to the had surgery or something and somebody says, you know, the third day is the worst. You ever heard that? You know where they got that from? They didn't get that from a medical book. They got it right there. Right there in the Bible. It says, and the third day when the pain was most severe. That's a biblical thing. You didn't know that, did you? That helped you to come. Next time your doctor says, hey, man, I knew that already. The Bible told me. Now, the doctor needed to tell me, the Bible told me about it. On the third day when the pain was severe, you know what they did? Levi and Simeon came into that city, totally destroyed, killed every male, killed Hamar, killed Shechem, and took and looted the whole city, took all of their possessions and all the women and children and carried them away as their own. And Jacob was absolutely shocked at the activity of his kids, of his sons. Certainly his daughter had been defiled. But he said, you have made me odious in the sight of all the people that we're around. And they said, Dad, they shouldn't have done it to our sister. They shouldn't have done it to your daughter. Chapter 34 is a chapter of tragedy. Now, if you're going to understand the Bible, you got to get in it emotionally, not just facts. How would you feel if your daughter had been raped. How would you feel if your sons did not just take it out on the person who did, but went about and devised a plan whereby they slaughtered a whole city of men and then looted that? I don't know about you, that's a tragedy. A tragedy that was in the heart and in the life and felt within the very spirit of Jacob. You know why? Because he was in the wrong place. He's in the wrong place. He's in Shechem. Everything went well with his father Abraham, his grandfather Abraham. When, whenever he was in Shechem, when he built an altar, well, Israel came to Shechem and he built an altar. Surely everything's going to go well. I'm here to tell you the place that things go well, listen to me, it's when you're where you're supposed to be. <laughs> Doing what God calls on you to do. You're not in a place because you just happen to be there. You're in a place because God tells you to be there. You're not just wandering through life. God has a direction for your life. And you're at that place because God wants you at that place at that time. And how do you know that? Because of those quotation marks. <laughs> those quotation marks that let you know that God speaks that God has a plan. So chapter 33, he's just there where his grandfather was. Chapter 34 is a tragedy. But look at chapter 35. 
Then God said to Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel. Arise and go to Bethel. Live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. What did he say? With quotation marks, I want you to go to Bethel. What was Bethel? Bethel was Jacob's spiritual journey. You remember what had happened whenever he left and he had to leave his father's house and had to go out to Laban's? On that first night whenever he camped and he, he came and he camped there at that place and he put a rock under his head and the angels, he saw that vision of the angels on the ladder coming back and forth and he wakes up that morning and he says, man, God is here and I didn't know it. And he named that place Bethel because it's the house of the Lord. He made a commitment to give the Lord a tenth of all that he increased him. He had a spiritual experience, a spiritual journey. That's where his spiritual life began. That's where it began. And what God says is, listen to me, Jacob. Listen to me, Israel. What I need for you to do, you go and walk your spiritual journey. You go to Bethel. Bethel is where it all got started. Bethel is the place where you came to me when you fled from Esau. Down here in verse 3 when he's talking to his children, he explains it more. He says, and let us arise and go to Bethel and I'll make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. That's the place it all started. He came to me whenever I had to flee Esau. He came to me in my day of distress. He came to me and he's been with me wherever I have gone. When I was at Laban's house, he was with me. And when I was coming back, he's been with me. God has been with me everywhere. And what did God say? Go to Bethel. That is your spiritual journey. That is your spiritual experience. And he doesn't just say, go to Bethel. Verse 1, he says, go, arise, and go to Bethel, that place where I appeared to you. And here's what he says, and live there. See the difference? I mean, over here, he, he bought with 100 pieces of silver. He bought him a land he, for his tents. He, he's going to live there. That's not where God wanted him to live. I want you to go to Bethel, he says. And the first thing you're going to do is I want you to go to Bethel and I want you to live there. That's where I would have you to live. That's where I want you to be. That's where your life is going to take on focus. That's where your life is going to have meaning. That's where your children are going to grow up. That's the place that I have for you. Let me tell you something. The safest place in all the world is in the center of God's will. You hear that? I'll say that again because I know I heard an amen back there somewhere. Amen. The safest place in all the world is the center of God's will. Amen? amen? That's the truth. I don't care where God would have you to be. He could send you to the most dangerous land there is. But it's the safest place in all the world because that's where God has you to be. And he knew that the place that he wanted Jacob was Bethel. The place where it all started... And it's the safest place in all the world for him. I want you to go there and I want you to live there. And what else he say? And I want you to make an altar there to God. It wasn't that, that Jacob decided to make an altar. What did God say? God says, and I want you to make an altar. I want you to make an altar to me right there in Bethel. He goes on though. Look what he says. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him. Now, interesting, whenever he settled over in Shechem, it doesn't say anything. Not one time does it say that he tells them they need to purify themselves and to give up their foreign gods. He doesn't say one thing about that at all. You know why? Hold on a second. You do not have spiritual conviction when you're walking in somebody else's shoes. You got it? You do not have a sense of spiritual conviction whenever you're living somebody else's journey. But do you know when you do have spiritual conviction? It's whenever you're re-walking what God has done in your life. Whenever you're going to that place that has meaning to you, that place God appeared to you, that place God ministered to you, that place God came and touched you, 
It has a spiritual significance and therefore you have conviction about that place. It's an important place. And anybody who's attached to me and my household and my family and my friends, if they're related to me, I want them to know how important a place that is and I want them to respect that place because that's where I met God. Look what he says, verse 2. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods which are among you and purify yourselves And change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress. Verse 4. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ear. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. You know what he said? Listen, we're going to a special place. We're going to an important place in my spiritual journey. And my children, my family, the first thing, get rid of any foreign gods. Anything that is something you worship, any idol that you've had, that you've been carrying around, that's important to you, something between you and God. The first thing I'm going to tell you have to have, you got to get rid of those household idols. you got to get rid of those foreign gods. you got to remove that because I'm telling you, I'm going to a place where I met the real God, the one true God. And I'm going to tell you, he's not going to be happy about those idols that you would have. So I'm telling you, you've got to get rid of the foreign gods. Get rid of the foreign gods. And the second thing is, you've got to purify yourself. You're about to encounter God. Why? Because that's where I met him. You're going to encounter God. He's a holy God, and you need to purify yourself. When it says purify itself, you go down to verse, in verse number 4, it says not only did they give up their foreign gods, they took off their earrings. These were good luck charms that they wore in their ears. It was the idea that if I wear these earrings, then the gods will favor me and show kindness to me and good things will come my way. And that's why they took the earrings off and gave them to Jacob. They're getting rid of the foreign gods and purifying themselves and making themselves holy and right before God. He says not only that, and you should change your garments. In other words, get dressed, get ready, put off the old, put on the new. We're coming to Bethel, and Bethel has meaning to me. It's a special place for me. And that's why God wanted to be there. God wanted him to journey there. God wanted to live there. God wanted that to be a special place. Now, here's the neat thing about it. You know they respected their patriarch, their, their dad. Nobody fussed about it. Nobody argued about it. What it said. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears. And, and what did Jacob do? Jacob went and hid them. Now, he didn't hide them in Bethel. He hid them where? He hid them in Shechem. And he hid them at the oak near Shechem. If you go back in Genesis 12, that's where Abraham was. He was taking it and he was burying it all. Can't you imagine in your mind what he's thinking? I'm burying all these foreign gods and I'm burying all of these these earrings and I'm burying everything there is. I'm burying it all. And I'm also burying all that happened in chapter 34 of my life. I'm burying about my daughter being raped. I'm burying about my sons destroyed. I'm I'm burying all of those things. I'm burying them here. And I'm going to go to where God has told me to go. Let me tell you something. Some of us need to dig a hole sometime. We need to dig a hole and we need to bury some stuff that is in our life or around our life because we're running around in Shechem instead of Bethel. We've got stuff in our life that doesn't need to be there and we need to dig a hole somewhere and bury it and get rid of it and make our way towards Bethel, which is a place where we're going to encounter God. A place where we're going to have a a walking, living, vibrant relationship with the Holy God, build an altar there where God is going to meet with us. That's exactly what he said. And here's the neat thing. All of them said, here, Dad, here, here's that stuff. Let's get rid of it. Do you know why they did that? Let me tell you. People will respect your conviction. They'll respect your conviction when they see you've got conviction. 
But you won't have conviction when you walk in somebody else's journey. You'll only have conviction when you're walking your own. When you're walking with God in that place where God has carried you, that place where God is, that place where God's been faithful, you have a deep, holy, precious conviction. And your children and people who love you respect your conviction, but you'll never find that conviction if you're trying to live somebody else's life, walk somebody else's journey. Conviction comes because you've encountered the living God and He's spoken to you and you're going to meet Him. Why did God tell Him to go to Bethel? Because I'm going to be there. That's where I want you to live. That's where I'm going to be. And he does show up there. You'll see next week that something unique happens in their life. The power of God is so around them. Nobody even, nobody even does battle with them. They're all in fear. They have a holy fear of this little small group of people who's traveling around. You know why? Because God is there. And then Jacob's going to meet with his God and God's going to reaffirm his call and the change of his name and the blessings upon his life. Why'd that happen? Because he went where God told him to go. All of us have our Bethel. All of us have that place where we encountered God, where we journeyed with the Lord. I'm not saying God calls us all back there, but I can tell you one thing. He wants us to walk our lives, our journey, our spiritual experience. And he wants us to walk ours and not somebody else's. I couldn't help as I was preparing this and looking over that this week. I couldn't help but think about it. I need to get my kids and my grandkids. And I need to go down to Pascagoula, Mississippi. That's my hometown. And there's a little church down there that it started as a mission church. We were charter members. My, my mom, my sister and I, we were charter members of that church. Starting this little old bitty building. And, and now, I don't know what it is now. I haven't been there a long time. I don't know what it, it ended up being part of the nursery, but it used to be the worship center. But I could go to that very place where I was standing. I, I, I could, in that building, I know exactly where it was, relationship doors. The very place I was standing when Jesus it's called It's not my name. necessarily in and how you dress. And when God spoke to my heart, and I got saved. It's not in what seven. you can achieve. But I can also go For over into the worship center. That is still the worship day center. Rest. And I can go the How very do place, we the very handle crisis when hope is God hard to find? To when forgiveness seems pointless? When ends don't meet God and life preach. is on the brink of change? Loving God, loving you, Parker Memorial Baptist Church. Me. That's a place for me where it started, where the journey started. You have your Bethel. You have your place. And I'm here to tell you, when you have conviction about that place, people who love you will respect that conviction. They'll respect you. And they'll do of you what you ask of them because they see that conviction in your heart and life. But you'll never have that conviction if you're just walking somebody else's journey. You have to walk your own. Isn't it great that God has each of us, for each of us, our own journey? My journey is never going to be like yours. Your journey is not going to be like mine, but it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be mine. It's supposed to be yours. And God has one for each of us. Are you walking yours? Are you living in it? Are you sure where you are is under quotation marks? Or is it just where you decided to wander to? Make sure you're in the quotation marks where God has you in that place that's special for you. It's a place of blessing, and we'll see, a place of tremendous power.